Hi, good day everybody. So today I'm going to talk about combinations. Uh, so this is a follow up to the other topic I've done, which is permutations. So if you haven't seen that video yet and you're struggling with permutations, I've left the link down below so you feel free to check it out. All right, so let's get straight into it. So in terms of what to expect, let me just move this around. Uh, so this is sort of the other part of counting. So permutations is about ordered selections, combinations is about unordered selections. So the general scenario you, uh, scenarios you deal with here include selecting people to form groups, uh, into committees so there's no particular order in which they have to go into the group as long as the group is formed uh, so sometimes this will be combined with a bit of permutations as well where you select the people that goes into the group first and then arrange them in a line or circle and things like that uh, i'll also talk about um, how it applies to probability as well and just a little bit of an oddball, I will also talk about uh, the pigeonhole principle. So that's kind of new in the uh, New South Wales HSC syllabus. So we'll take a very quick look at that as well. So I've done actually a quite a few of these videos on various topics for the HSC Mathematics and Extension 1 course. So feel free to check it out on our YouTube channel or you can go to our website as well. There's some additional resources there. Hopefully that can help you. All right, let's have a look. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Amy. I'm the co-founder of Pinnacle Coaching College. Uh, my main expertise has always been around uh, Extension 1 and Extension 2 Math. So I'm very familiar with the uh, New South Wales curriculum um, and how it applies to HSC. All right, so what is a combination? So as mentioned before, combinations are unordered selections. It, it, it just simply means order doesn't matter, right? So I think the best way to understand this is um, maybe I'll use a bit of visuals here. So if I have group that has three members in it, A, B, and C, it doesn't matter if I put A in first then followed by B and C, or if I put B in first followed by A and C, you still have a group consisting of members A, B, C. So that's uh, why order doesn't matter. The order in which they go into the group doesn't matter as long as you form the group of three. So you'll find the typical situations here we'll be talking about um, forming groups, forming committees, um, and then sitting on tables sometimes. And the order in which they're chosen doesn't matter. And hopefully that gives you some idea as well uh, how to distinguish questions that are permutation questions versus combination questions. I, I, th I find that quite often that's where students get confused. They don't know, or oh, should I be applying permutations to this? So is this like a free factorial question? Or is this a combination question where order doesn't matter? So you'll start to see through the questions in this uh, video that um, the type of question that comes up is just throwing people into committees and groups, whereas in the previous video on permutations is about arranging them into lines, arranging them into circles and things like that. All right, so the main one thing you need to know to be able to calculate combinations is the notation NCK. All right, so without going into too much depth what it actually means i would like to focus on the application instead just know that this is a calculator button uh, for now so on my calculator i'll see if you can see this so just above the division sign i have a ncr button so for me to activate that for example, if I wanted to type in uh, 5C2, for example, so I have to type in 5, shift that division button, and 2. So my screen now looks a bit like this. So 5C2, hit equal, I get 10. Okay, so what a lot of my students um, do to remember this notation or how sort of the purpose for which it's useful, you can think of this as um, you have M members in total, 
and C is choosing, okay? N choose K, right? Out of N members, you're choosing K members to go into your group. So that hopefully that's helpful for you as well. All right, so let's get cracking on the questions. Question one, we've got choosing people to form our group. So that's the situation we are with. Uh, in how many ways can a group of four be selected from 10 people if there are no restrictions? So very simple here. In any question, you're always asking yourself two questions, right? So one question is how many people you have to choose from and how many do you want to choose? So in that first instance there, uh, we have, we want to choose four people from 10 people, no restrictions. So 10, C, 4. That's it, okay? Putting that into the calculator, it should be 210. B, Michelle is included in the group. So if there are preferences, deal with them first. So you can think of it, our group currently like this. So Michelle, it's in the group already, okay? So you only have to choose three more other people to fill out the three remaining spots. So at this point in time, we have 10 people to begin with minus Michelle. So we actually only have nine people, okay? And nine people to choose from into three spots, 9C3. That should give you 84. All right, I'm hoping that makes sense. So C. This time, Michelle excluded from the group. So in our little group here, we have four open spots, right? Michelle's excluded, so no one's in the group at the moment. So we need to choose four people to fill the four spots. But how many people we get to choose from? Not 10, but nine, yeah? So the 10 people minus Michelle. Michelle cannot be in it. So 9C4, which gives you 126. And then finally, what proportion of all possible groups contain Michelle? So we can calculate that based on what we've calculated. So we've calculated the number um, of such groups that Michelle is included, which is 84. And the total cases that's not restricted is 210. So 210 on the bottom. So that gives you two fifths. So two-fifths of the total groups will contain Michelle. All right, hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't quite make sense yet, don't worry. We have had plenty of questions um, that we will go through today. Now, um, I think I always say this to my students, the best way to learn is for you to try the questions as well. So feel free to pause the video, have a go first before looking at the answers. Moving on. All right, so this time we are choosing people into a committee. We've got a committee of seven. So the group has to be formed uh, by seven people in total. And your choices include seven men plus nine women. So seven plus nine, that is 16 people in total. All right, part A. Uh, how many such committees are possible if there are no restrictions? So 16 people to choose from, you need to choose seven. So that should give you 11,440 possibilities. All right, B, all members are to be female. So you still need to choose seven, right? You're forming a committee of seven, but the pool from which you can choose from is the nine women only if you, have to, uh, if you want to create a female only committee. So nine C7, which gives you 36 such committees. All right, C, all members are to be male. So same thing. Uh, you still have to choose seven. You have seven men. That would be one, which makes sense because the only um, committee is basically when all of them are in there. That's it. All right, there's no other options. And finally, two men. So we can do the men first. So we need to choose two uh, out of the seven men. Now we have... Out of the seven spots, two spots are filled, five spots are still vacant. They should be filled by females, right? Otherwise, you don't have exactly two men. So filled out by five females, and there are nine, nine C5, 
All right, so they have to add up to seven because you're from forming a committee of seven. Uh, multiply that together. So two men, five women. All right, so two, six, four, six. All right, what if we change this up a bit? So same situation, so 16 people in total. Four women, three men. So four women, three men. So same idea, you can pick the women first. So nine, C, four, and three men, seven, C, three. Multiply that together, you get four, four, one, zero. All right, so still pretty easy for, so far. Majority women. So now this time, it's going to encompass a lot of different cases, right? Uh, it's not just going to be as straightforward as just oh, four women and three men. So let's think about how we can achieve this. Um, we are trying to form a committee of seven. So to have majority women, you can have all seven women. So all women. That's one case. Six women, one man. That's another case. Five women, two men. Four women, three men. Okay, and that's it. So four women, three men, that's it. So next one now will be three women, um, four men. So that's now becoming majority men. So you don't want that scenario. All right, so then you calculate it, right? So 9C7 and then 9C6, one men from the 7, 7C1, seven five, uh, 9C5, 7C2, 9C4, 7c3 and that's it all right so if you have different cases that fall under the scenario you're looking at you just add them together so that should give you 7680 in total so hopefully that makes sense to you uh, so there's two more hold on all right, so let's take a look at the next two. So now we have um, the same situation. We want a particular men to be included. So that's similar to that Michelle scenario, right? So let's call that particular man uh, A, right? So A, Mr. A has to be in the group. Then you've got six more spots to fill so you need to choose six more people now how many people you get to choose from well you have 16 people in total to begin with you've used mr a already so there are 15 people to choose from so 15 c6 5005 and then finally uh, a particular man must not be included so in this same id uh, we've got seven spots to fill so we need to choose seven and in terms of the number of members you can draw from 16 minus mr a because it has to be excluded so 15 15 c7 that should get you six four three five so in this case there are slightly more um, of such groups and i think that's it on this question so let's take a look at the concept of distinguishable groups so in this case we've got 18 students nine male nine female travel from school to the sports ground seven of them go into a minivan and then six of them go into a car three of them go on to bike and two of them walk all right so minivan cars bikes walk now, they are distinguishable groups for two reasons. So, firstly, they all have different capacities, so 7, 6, 3, 2. And the second thing is they are clearly different things. A minifan is different from a car, different from a bike, different from 
or walking okay so how we deal with distinguishable groups you just go and take your 18 people um, just pick a particular mode of transport first start choosing people to go into those groups first uh, it's not really in any particular order it doesn't matter if you can if you want to do cars first that's fine or if you want to do bikes first that's fine I'll just do it in this order so mini fan we have 18 people at this point and we want to choose uh, seven of them to go to the mini fan okay so after we've done the mini fan 18 minus 7 is 11 so we have 11 people left and we need to choose six more to go into cars all right so 11 minus 6 five people at the moment so five choose another three to go on bikes and whoever's left to see two is just going to walk all right so that's pretty much the answer to part a which should give you a huge number one four seven zero two six eight eight zero okay so what if there is a restriction here in how many ways can they be distributed if none of the girls walk so what you can do is deal with walk first right because that's the um, mode of transport that has a restriction on it so we have nine guys so nine c2 to walk first yeah none of the girls being selected to walk only the boys so right now um, we've got nine plus nine so 18 people 18 minus 2 16 people left right because now we can anyone can go into the other modes of transport so 16 c3 on the bikes so you can see I do it in reverse order, it shouldn't matter too much. Um, and then 16 minus, 16 minus 3, 13, 13 C6, go into car. Uh, whoever's left 7 has to go into the minivan. And that's it. Alright, so putting those numbers in. Alright, so that's the final answer for this one. So this is an example of distinct distinguishable groups. So just to summarize, what how do you know if groups are distinguishable? So one one thing to look for is they have different number of members in it, so different number of members or they have like different names or different colors or there's just um, ways that they're labeled uh, a little bit differently okay so different names labels etc all right so i think to truly appreciate this you need to take a look at an example where there's indistinguishable groups so you know well what is the difference between the two types so let's have a look all right so we've got in how many ways can six a group of six people be divided into into two unequal groups and into two equal groups so what i might do is actually deal with two equal groups first because two equal groups so you have a group of three one two three you have another group of three one two three now because they didn't say team a and team b or red and blue or anything like that just two equal groups of three so they're not distinguishable from each other so let me give you an example if i have a b c in one group and d e f in another group that is two groups with ABC in one group DEF in another group and it would not have matter if I put DEF on the left side first and ABC on the right side first right those are exactly the same thing you have a group with DEF you have a group of ABC so that's the um, thinking around indistinguishable groups so how would that work so in this case very similar to the previous situation so you have six people in total choose three to go into one group one whoever's left 
goes into the um, the second group and because they are two indistinguishable groups divided by two factorial so what that does is repeat so remove that repeat uh, repeated groups so for example if we just did the top bit it would have count that as one and two separate types of groups right but essentially they're the same thing so we remove the duplication so that gives us 10 in this case so whereas if it's unequal groups they are distinguishable right so there are actually a couple of cases here so that's why i want to do it separately so you can for example have a group of one and a group of uh one two three four five right so distinguishable because there's a group of one and a group of five and then two four okay so same thing distinguishable groups two and four three three is basically this situation here all right so let's start with one five first so six c one five c five and then this one will be six c two five uh, not five four c four all right different cases added together that should get you 21 in total so hopefully that makes sense what is a distinguishable group so in this case neither is actually uh, labeled in any way but they're distinguishable because i can say oh that's clearly a group of one and that's clearly a group of five whereas in part b they're both groups of three so you can't tell what they are yeah unless you say oh you are group red and group green so let's take a look at another more complicated situation so we've got nine players to be divided into two teams of four and one umpire in how many ways can the teams be formed okay so let's think about this so we've got one two three four one two three four umpire is one essentially okay so two teams and one umpire and how you can think about this is uh the group of one which is the umpire and the group of fours are obviously distinguishable right one versus four but in this case the fours and the fours itself they are indistinguishable so we'll need to adjust for that all right so nine c four to do the first group and then you have five people left now so five c four to do the second group times uh the last person one c one divide that by two factorial because of the indistinguishable groups in the teams calculate that should give you 315 all right so part b if two particular people cannot be on the same team how many different combinations are possible so let's say a and b are those two people who cannot be on the same team there's a couple of scenarios here all right so scenario one it's when if one of them is an umpire then the other one can be in any team there shouldn't be any problem because they won't be in the same team if one of them is an umpire so we have a group of one so let's illustrate these cases first all right so if it's a or b in that one there's two ways to fill the position of the umpire okay so there's two different ways either a or b and then we have eight people left now in two groups so eight c4 four c4 four, indistinguishable groups divided by two factorial that should get you 70. so then from here uh scenario two if both of them are on one of the teams then you need to make sure they are separated so we might do the teams first so let's say a is in the first team b is in the second team then you've got three spots to fill three spots to fill are uh, the umpire position so right now we've used a we've used b so there are seven people left so seven c three 
to fill out that first group and then 4C3 to fill out the second group, 1C1 for the umpire. Now this time we don't need to divide by 2 factorial because uh, they are distinguishable groups. You can say that is A's team because A is in it and then the other one's B's team and B's in it. So they are now distinguishable. You don't need to divide by 2 factorial. So that gives you 140. Alright, so the total is equal to 70 plus 140 to 10. So I hope that makes sense. So this scenario really teases out when a group so they are both equal groups, right? Teams are four, but when does it become distinguishable, right? And in this case, just by putting a certain member in there, it now becomes A's team and B's team. All right, so in the next scenario, we are going to take a look at um, not just choosing people and throw them onto teams, throw them onto committees. We're going to take that extra step of also arranging them as well. So in this case, we've got four dancers, uh, three singers to be arranged in a row. And there are eight dancers and five singers to choose from. So first you choose the people, then you arrange them. Okay, so eight, C, four to choose the dancers. Uh, 5, C, 3 to choose the singers. So right now, if you think about it, I have 4 dancers and 3 singers. Okay, now I have to arrange them in a row. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 7 factorial, yeah, to arrange 7 people in a row. That is pretty much it. Put that into the calculator. That should get you 3, 5, 2, 8. Zero, zero, zero. So about three and a half million such possibilities. So let's take a look at another one. This time, circle. There are two round tables, one oak and one pine, each of them with five seats. How many ways can a group of 10 be seated? Okay, so again, two stages, right? Select the people to go onto each of the tables and then arrange. All right, so got oak. Uh, we've got pine. So we will go 10 C5, so 10 choose 5 to go onto the oak table. Then whoever's left has to go on to the pine table. Then the actual arrangement. All right, so you've got, imagine you've got a group of five people sitting next to the table ready for arrangement. Okay, so Remember, circle arrangement is one less than straight line. So if there are five people, four factorial. And same with the other table, four factorial. Okay, so two parts of it to this. So choose the people. Choose the people and then arrange them in circles. Okay, circles of five spots, basically. All right, so put that into the calculator. That should get you 145152. Part B. If both are O tables, how does that change the answer? So see if you actually understood this. So this relates back to the concept of indistinguishable groups. If they are now both O tables, right? You can't tell one O table from a second O table. So... What happens is it's the same calculation, right? So I'll just copy the line exactly first. Exactly the same calculation, but the only difference is you will need to now divide that by two factorial because they've became indistinguishable groups. Both are O table. Alright, so basically it's just half of these. So seven, two, five, seven, six. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So that ropes in a little bit of that concept around indistinguishable groups and arrangements as well. So finally, we want to take a look at how that applies to probability. So remember, how do you calculate probability is basically event space over sample space. So event space is um, things like... Um, 
selecting the number of groups that fit the criteria of the question, right? So I select our selection based on the criteria of the question. Okay, and sample space is basically the same selection, but no restrictions. Yeah, if the event space has some sort of restriction, so for example, like the very first case, Michelle has to be included, so that's a restriction. Yeah, sample space will be doing the same thing, but no restriction. So, so same selection without restrictions. So that's basically it. So let's go straight into an example. Now, for question eight and nine, these probabilities are based around a deck of playing cards. Uh, if you're not familiar with a uh, deck of cards, maybe you should go get yourself a deck and just you know bring it to school and play with your friends because I think that's the best way for you to familiarize well what the what is in the deck of cards, right? But for those of you who have no idea, he is basically a picture uh, of all the cards. So a standard deck of cards in any exam question unless they say otherwise does not include jokers so there are two jokers in the deck they're not included uh, we are talking about from ace to king for each suit so suit are these these things right so this is a uh, club a spade a heart and a diamond and notice their color as uh, color as well right so diamonds and hearts are red um, clubs and spades are black and jack queen king are what are considered picture cards so if the question talks about picture cards that's what they are referring to all right, so if you need to, just Google a deck of playing cards and you'll see the images there and you can use that to help you answer these type of questions. All right, so in this case, we've got from our standard pack of 52 cards, free a selector at random, find the probability that they are jack of spade, two of clubs, uh, seven of diamonds. Okay. So first of all, before I even do these, so these are all event spaces, right? The restrictions. So what is the sample space in this one? So the sample space in this one would be just choosing three cards at random, no restrictions. Yeah, let me repeat that. Choosing three cards at random, no restrictions. So 52C3, okay? So in that first instance, Jack of spade, two of clubs, seven of diamonds. These are three very specific cards. If you, if you come back to this, uh, jack spade, it's this one here. Sorry, I just try to grab the question so I know I'm circling the right thing. Yep, jack of spade, two of clubs, and seven of diamonds. So three very specific cards. So the only way to pick up those three specific cards is just one. There's only one case, right? Where you pick up three cards and those exactly three cards. So the probability in this case will be 1 over 52C3. So 1 over the sample space, which is 1 over 22100. All right. B, all three are aces. So let's go back and have a look. So there are four aces in total in the entire deck. So out of the four aces, we're going to choose three to form our three aces and then put that over the sample space. That should give you one on five, five, two, five. C. Diamonds. Diamonds is the entire suit. So that entire suit here. Okay, so there are 13 cards that are diamond in total. So 13 C3 out of all the diamonds. I'm going to choose three of them and put that over the sample space. That should give you 11 on A50. 
Alright, so hopefully so far is making sense. Moving on. So D, all from the same suit. So same suit just means they're either all clubs, all spades, all hearts, all diamonds. Okay, so how, there's a couple of ways you can think about this. So what you can, you can do is pick a suit first. So 4C1, yeah, after four suits, spade, diamond, clubs, hearts, yeah, choose one. And then 13 cards in that particular suit, choose three. Okay, or you can think of this if you sort of like ignore the 4C1. If you have all, all diamonds, right, it will just be 13C3. Then you repeat that for all spades, all hearts, all clubs, right? So that's four different situations times four. So that's another way of doing it because 4C1 is just four. All right. Put that over the sample space, so 52C3. That should get you 22 on 425. Picture cards. All right, so let's go and look at our deck again. How many picture cards are there? So there are three by four, so 12 picture cards in total. So if you want picture cards, 12C3. Put that over, 52C3, that's your probability, 11 on 1105. F, two are red, one, are, one is black. So the deck is divided exactly half red, half black. So to choose red, there are 26 reds to choose from, choose two of them. And there's also 26 black and you want to choose one. Put that over the sample space. Calculate that. Should be 13 on 34. Okay. So you can see the chances here are much higher because there's just a lot more cards that are red and black. Next one. One is a seven. One is an eight. One is a nine. So if you go back and look at the deck of cards, there's four sevens, four eights, four nines. So to achieve that result, 4C1 for the 7s, 4C1 for the 8s, 4C1 for the 9s, and then sample space, put that into the calculator. That should give you 16, 5525. Five, H, two are 7s, 1s are 6. So there are four 7s, so 4C2. And four sixes, so four C one. Put that into the calculator. That should be six on five five two five. All right, so the next one, we've got exactly one is a diamond. So this is where you have to be careful here. So we'll do the diamond first. So 13C1 to choose the diamond. Now, let's go back to the deck so you've got some visuals. So once you've picked up one of the diamonds, you can't pick another diamond because now you don't have exactly one diamond. So you have to pick from the remainder of the deck, right? Any of the hearts, spade, clubs. So there are... 39 of them, right? 13 times 3. So 39C2. So that should give you 741 on 1700. J, at least two of them are diamonds. So when you see the word at least, really think about, okay, what are the different cases? So you can have two diamonds, and one non-diamond, right? Or you have the all three are diamonds. So let's do all three are diamonds first because that's kind of easy. So 13, C3, 13 diamonds, choose three. And this one, 13, C2, and the remaining 39 non-diamond cards, choose one. All right, and then just add them together. I might do that one separately. So let me just put that into the calculator. All right, 
So that's 117850. And that one is 11 on 850. I think we've calculated this one before. All right, so the total probability is 117 on 850 plus 11 on 850. which should give you 64 on 425. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Now we're going to push ourselves a little bit. This is a very basic one um, just to show you how probability works. The next one let's play poker not that i recommend gambling by the way but poker is still a good game uh so if you haven't played poker before maybe you can grab a group of friends and that's your opportunity to become familiar with a deck of cards all right so getting a poker hand requires to, um you to have five cards and I think this where considering the right things is very important in calculating the probability. So the sample space, first of all, would be out of the 52 cards, you need to choose five cards. Yeah? So now we look at the different conditions. One pair. So let's talk about the pair first. So to form a pair, Let's go back. Okay, so coming back to here, to form a pair, you have to pick a particular type first, right? Either all aces, twos, threes, so on, right? And let's say if you want a pair of five, you have to pick two out of the four, right, to form a pair. So with that in mind, let's pick the pairs. So we have 13C1 first to just to choose, are we going to do aces or are we going to do fives? Are we going to do queens, right? There are 13 ways to do that. And then once you've decided which one you're going to go with, let's say fives, I'm going, I want a pair five, 4C2 to form your pair five. So you can have a club and a diamond or spade and a diamond and so on and so forth. All right, so I've picked my pair now. Then you have three more cards. Now these three cards has to be different, if that makes sense. So you can't just go, oh, okay, uh, we have how many cards? So 52 minus three, no, minus four. So 52 minus four, we have 48 cards left. So let's just um, randomly, uh, pick three more cards. Well, you can't do that because the you can potentially get a triple like that, right? Then you no longer only have one pair. So what we're going to do is, again, we're going to pick three more. So let's say we use fives, then we've got 12 more other kinds of cards we can choose from. Pick three of them. So we can do aces, 10, and jack, for example. So once you identify them, each of them, you choose one just to make sure you don't accidentally get a pair right you need to make sure the rest is non-pair all right so that's essentially it put that uh, on the sample space and put that into the calculator so by the way um i mean you'll get the hang of this 13c1 anything c1 is just a number so 13c1 is 13 4c1 is 4 so how you can put this into the calculator to make it easy is 13 times 4c2 times 12c3 times 4 cube right because there's three of them so that might be easier for you to put into the calculator which should give you 352 over 833. Now, if this doesn't make sense, just leave comments down below and I'll try to explain it as best I can because this is a little bit confusing. All right, so this time two pairs. So pair, pair, single, right? So to do the two pairs out of the 13 different kinds, we are just going to choose two, so maybe fives and tens, for example. All right, so we're going to do 
4C2 to do the first pair and then another 4C2 to form the second pair. And then the single, this one you are sort of free to do whatever, right? So you've, you can't use the same as the 4 and the 4, yeah, that's in the pair. So that's 52 minus 8. I'll just make sure I've got my calculations right. Yeah, 52 minus 8 is 44. So the 44 remaining cards, choose 1. Okay, so let's make sure we understood this. So let's say we have pair fives, pair fives, and pair tens, for example, right? Then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, eleven times four, forty-four cards to choose from. So that's what I'm trying to get at. All right, so forty-four C one. Put that over 52C5. That should get you 198 on 4165. Let's take a look at the next one. This time we have three of a kind. So three of a kind. Then you have two more cards that are... Um, separate from each other and obviously not the same as this guy okay now I I mean this is a bit of a poker terminology free of a kind uh, free of a kind is should not be paired up with a pair because that is actually a very specific um, category which I forgot what I think it's called full house that's what it is yeah if you have three of a kind and a pair that's called a full house so that's not what we're shooting for so you need to make sure those two are not pairs either all right so then uh three of a kind how do we achieve this so we pick 13c1 first so are we going to have triple fires are we going to have triple kings so let's say triple kings yeah let's make it good and then from the kings we choose three cards to form the three of a kind. And then for the two remaining ones, you need to make sure they don't form a pair accidentally. So that will be 12C2. Yeah, choose two more. And then 4C1 to choose the first one. Let's say a five. And 4C1, let's say a six. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Yeah. So 88. On four one six five. Hi, four of a kind. So four of a kind, and then one spot or oh, one random card. So again, thirteen C one to pick. Are you going to have all kings, all queens, etc.? So after that, it's just four C four. You're using all of them, which is one. Okay, and then you have forty eight cards left. You haven't touched. You just need to pick one more to form that last one. So one on four, one, six, five. All right, so let's up the difficulty just a little bit. All right, yes, ah, I was right. It's a full house. Okay, so full house is very specific. You have a pair with a three of a kind. Okay, so we can start with the pair first. And then we'll do three of a kind. All right, so a pair, again, 13C1 to choose uh, which one you want. And then 4C2 to actually create the pair. So let's say I choose aces and then choose two of the four aces. And then three of a kind, so 12C1. So pick another one and then pick three of them. So 4C3. I think that is it, yeah. Uh, so I put that into the calculator. So that's six on four one six five. And F straight. Now straight is a little bit tricky. So a straight is basically if you have consecutive cards. Yeah. So for example, uh, Ace two three four five. That's one instance. Okay. So to answer this question, I think it's good to understand what is considered a straight. Let's say. Um, 
if we just look at like one particular suit, right? It doesn't really matter. So as I mentioned, I have ace, two, three, four, five. Then you have two, three, four, five, six. Three, four, five, six, seven. I'm just going to start writing them. Okay, so that's what they mean by ace high or ace low. Ace low would be ace protruder as a one, so one, two, three, four, five, and ace high is ten, jack, queen, king, ace. Okay, so you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten such different straights. Okay, so there are ten ways to achieve a straight. And each individual card, so for example, the first situation, the ace can be a uh, club, spade, diamond, or heart. Same with the two. It could be a club, spade, diamond, or heart, and three, and so on. So every single one of them, 4C1, right, five times. All right, or you can just do 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, which is 4 to the power of 5. All right, so that gives you 1, 2, 8 over 3, 2, 4, 8, 7. All right, so that's a more tricky scenario because you actually have to think about how many strikes can I form. And then once you've got that, then you can go and calculate the selection of the cards. All right, so the last little bit, uh, just to wrap this up, uh, nice and easy principle, the pigeonhole principle. Principle. Okay, the the pigeonhole principle is just a, I can't believe there's a name for this, but um, it's just a fancy way of um saying something that's very obvious, and anyone with a bit of logic can work this out. So in this example, for example, if you have nine spots, right, or nine holes. And you have 10 pigeons. So we have nine pigeons in their respective hole already. And then you have one more pigeon. So this one pigeon has to pick a hole to go into. So let's say he goes into this one. So all that is saying is if you have 10 pigeons and nine holes, at least one of the hole has to contain two pigeons. Um, and that's pretty obvious because that 10th pigeon has to go somewhere. So someone has to take an extra one. Okay, so that's all it is. Uh, so it's very logical. So more generally, if you have n plus one or more pigeons to place into n pigeon holes, then you, at, you expect that at least one of the holes is going to contain two or more pigeons. Okay, so applying that to some examples. So you have a drawer of uh, green and yellow socks that have not been arranged in pairs. Socks can be worn on either foot. What is the least number of socks that you must take from the drawers to be sure you have at least one pair? Okay, so you can think of your foot. All right, so that's my foot. I'm not a great drawer, so please forgive me. Okay, so you have two foots, right? So you can think of that as your two pigeon holes. So you have to make sure you pick uh, one, two, three, yellow, green, yellow, for example. Okay. Yeah. You have to pick at least three socks to make sure you have one matching pair. Right. You have to make sure at least you have um, two in the same hole, so to speak. Right. So that's so far how you will answer this one. So there are three um, is the answer. So at least three. Or you can also understand it this way. Uh, think of this as um, a probability tree. So in the first selection, you, you can either pick a green or yellow. So I'm just going to keep drawing the tree just to show you.
Okay, so you can see from the tree that in very lucky cases, you can get the first one is green and then the second one immediately matches, you stop, right? Same with yellow. If you get the first one yellow and the second yellow, you stop. But the least amount you'll have to do to guarantee a match will be these guys, right? So green, yellow, the third draw is basically deciding whether you're going to have or what type of pair you're going to have. So one draw, two draw, three draw, you'll get a matching green. Or one draw, two draw, third draw, you'll get a matching yellow, so to speak. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's take a look at another example. So we've got a bag containing green, black, Yellow, white, red, blue jelly babies. How many jelly babies must Olivia take out of the bag so that she makes sure she takes two of the same color? All right, so again, the same idea. Let's say it is real. what these questions are saying. Okay, let's say the worst case scenario, you're very, very unlucky. So you get a green on your first draw, black on your second draw, yellow on your third draw, white on your fourth, red, and then blue. Okay, so... Uh, after six draw, you manage to get them all different. Then on the seventh draw, doesn't matter what color it is. Let's say I picked up a yellow, it's gonna match with one of the previous ones you've already taken out the bag. So to answer the question, how many must you take out so that to make sure to take two of the same color? So that will be seven. Right? You have to take out at least seven to guarantee a match because on the most unlucky scenario, yeah, where all six draws turns out to be different colors, so that's blue, sorry, yeah, on the seventh draw, it will match with something, right? One of the ones you've already drawn. All right, so that's basically the concept. So there are six pigeonholes and you need seven pigeons to guarantee at least two of them goes into the same hole. And then back to pigeons. We have seven pigeons sitting in three holes. Explain why one pigeon hole must contain at least three pigeons. So why don't we actually investigate this? So again, we are looking at the worst case scenario here pretty much. So if you have seven pigeons, let's distribute them equally, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now you have a seventh pigeon, the seventh pigeon has to go into one of those holes. So let's say the seventh pigeon goes into this hole. So one of the holes will contain at least three pigeons. Now, I do get a lot of questions also. Well, can't you have like one in one of the holes? Then it will be one. Well, let's see how that will work, right? If it's only one, if you want to make sure only one hole has one pigeon, so you have one, right? I still have six left, so let's say I distribute them evenly, then all these two holes will have three, right? Or if you go one and one, then you have four more to go, uh, no, more than four, five more to go, right? Then all five have to squeeze in that poor hole, right? So the idea here is this is the best case scenario so you'll have to have one hole with at least three on and these more extreme cases you have five squeeze into one so that's more than three right and this one will be three three so it's still at least three all right so hopefully that makes sense so you're talking about um the case where they're most spread out yeah distribute them evenly whoever's left yeah had to go into one of the holes so one of the hole has to have at least three pigeons All right, so finally, uh, we have a group of 75 people this time in a talent context, uh, contest placed in different audition rooms. So we have four rooms, right, if you think about it, four rooms, one, two, three, four. So you can think of them as your four pigeonholes. If there, uh, there are at least X people in one of the rooms, find the value of X. Okay, so the easiest way to think about this is let's divide se um, 70 bit 5 by 4 right and just see what that is so like the previous case you want to distribute them evenly first and see how that will play out so 75 divided by 4 gets you 18.75 so that means if i was to spread them evenly right you have 18 people in each of the rooms 18 18 18 18 
okay so 18 times 4 72 so we've allocated 72 people we've got three more people to go okay so the best way to understand this is okay if i spread them out evenly again so plus one plus one plus one they um the room has to have at least 19 people yeah in one of the rooms so usually it's just really 75 divided by four and then round up that's usually how you get to the answer so x is equals to 19 but the actual logic behind it is if you spread them evenly 18 18 18 18 you have three more people left then at least one of the rooms in this case three of the rooms have 19 people yeah to get that to spread evenly and that's basically it so this is another meme i would like to share with you hopefully you can appreciate that and that is it for today so hopefully you found this very helpful i know permutations combinations um it's one of those topics that gets a lot of both year 11 and year 12 students depending on when your school decide to do it and um uh, well, at least I found personally when I learned this at school, no one really explained how the counting process works. And I felt like I kind of had to learn that on my own through like trial and error, trial and error, try to guess, oh, let's try this logic and then check the answers. Does that look right? It's like, damn, it's wrong, right? And I definitely feel that pain because I did that as a student, trying to like, where the heck did this answer come from? So hopefully these two um, videos, so the permutations, um, one I did last week and the combination one which is this one here uh, it's helping you understand your homework understand the question and it's making uh, things a little bit simpler to understand so if you really like this video and you found that it helps you please give me a thumbs up so I know to keep producing this type of content and leave some comments down below right if you have any um, confusions about the questions I went through in this video let me know I will try to explain it to you um, or if you have any topic suggestions right if there is anything you're struggling ask also oh i can't wrap my head around this concept again let me know and you know that will be something i can do in the future as well and that's it for today bye for now